Hi, everyone. Welcome in this uh, unnatural uh, situation with the virtual session on the domain-driven design architecture patterns in Apex. Um, so um, together with my colleague, uh, we want to present you just a little bit of uh, uh, basics. And I will also uh, introduce ourselves, but before we, we actually begin, I have uh, this kind of short story uh, to begin with. So um, we are actually developing a couple of uh, Salesforce uh, solutions uh, from quite some time. And uh, I wanted to ask you a question whether you sometimes feel, uh, especially when you are working on a, on a Salesforce implementation project, or actually any software project, do you feel sometimes like this, that the system is actually chasing you at some stage and rolling like a ball from the heel, and it's like a gigantic monster uh, that was created? So we, we, I, I mean, this is the feeling that I sometimes have, and that's actually the, the reason why we, we made this story. So let me try to um, let me try to explain you, and we'll start from the basics of how physics works. So, so if we take a hill and we put a ball on this hill, as you can see, um, uh, the ball will actually roll down this hill with the force of gravity. And uh, I think uh, that this uh, this kind of uh, physical phenomenon can be quite well applied to also software engineering. So. Let's change the ball with the with with a software piece of software, and you will see that over the time, with like technical depth, with uh, growing business pressure, um, also the rapidly changing uh, situation in terms around the people who are developing uh, the software, you will see that the system is growing in size and it reaches this kind of inertia. Um, uh, and it's rolling basically down the hill faster and faster, growing in size. So eventually we end up with a situation that is fairly common to, uh, to everyone uh, who is working on a larger project. Yeah, so something like, like this. This short introduction is uh, basically aimed to set a little bit of level on what this session is going to be about. Uh, so. Together with my colleague, uh, we will try to uh, explain to you the, a domain-driven design, an approach that we found um, over our journey to find a way to actually build a better software that can cope with this kind of changing business environment. And we're going to explain two things. Um, first, what is the DDD? and how to actually apply it in real life also showing uh, like a very nice method that allows you to build a model of your software my name is Maciej Sim um, um, every day I'm actually uh, having the role of uh, head of product at Anexo uh, which is Salesforce ISV and Platinum partner from Poland and uh, we're hosting you today with uh, one of like the uh, lead people who is also uh, uh, navigating this initiative at Anexo, uh, Konrad Karaś, who is with me. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Konrad Karaś, and uh, I've been working as a Salesforce developer for uh, three years. And now I was given the role of a Salesforce architect, and I try to adapt domain-driven design patterns in our application. Thanks. So uh, let me quickly explain what is the domain-driven design. So it's actually according to Wiki definition, it's an approach to software development, really for complex needs. And the way it tries to approach software development is uh, to be able to connect the implementation to an evolving model. So this is like the key, um, key thing to understand. 
I would like to recommend you a couple of books about it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, some of the architects uh, already are familiar with Eric Evans or uh, Vogue Vernon, uh, but these are really great books. Um, it changed uh, my approach to software development it, in, in several ways. What domain-driven design could help you with? Um, so especially um, it is uh, trying to build a consistent terminology in, in the whole software engineering team, terminology that is consistent between business people and technical people. It helps you to actually build a model of your software and develop your software um, uh, in line with this model. Um, it also helps you to build a model that is implementable uh, because frequently, I believe, at least at my experience, I've been faced with uh, like, a, like a software model or let's say it a result of analysis that is not implementable. So whenever we really had to start an implementation project, um, we, we really, before development, we really needed to repeat the analytical uh, part. One of the things uh, that is quite important for DDD is also that database is not a model of your software. A database is a static structure on how information is per persisted in the system. And it doesn't actually uh, replicate all the business rules and behaviors that are, uh, uh, are in the system. Finally, something that we, we also look at uh, quite interestingly is uh, this kind of making a consistent behavior in various contexts. So whether you do an operation via UI or API, we want the system to behave in a very similar way. A link to a nice tutorial from Vadim. There will be two levels of DDD, um, strategic, that focuses on modeling like a big blocks of software, like modules of your software, focused on defining the common language, ubiquitous uh, language among the whole project team, and tactical, which really focuses on modeling your classes, interfaces, and it is really about design patterns that you use when you build your software. Uh, we will uh, we will come to these uh, patterns um, at the end of the session and we'll show some uh, of the apex code uh, as a result. Now, DDD is all about building a model. So um, how to actually build a model? That was one of the first questions that we had. And that's how we found a very nice workshop-based tool, which is called In Event Storming. Uh, let me quickly tell you about what Event Storming is and how it works, because we will show you today how to start from this kind of analytical method and then translate it into the code. So this is a sample result of, of the storming session. And as you can see, and by the way, uh, storming is a method that was uh, uh, um, proposed by Alberto Brandolini, very, very worth reading book. And uh, as you have seen in the picture, all you need for, for the storming session is uh, all people in one room, some pen, some papers, some post-it cards in dif different colors, and like a wall that will be your infinite modeling space. How does this storming session would work? We really start from trying to map a big picture of your system. So the expectation of so-called big picture session is to build like an overview. And we, we will start the storming session with identifying domain events that are happening in our software. Actually, these are events that are happening in the business, not in software. Event is something that is significant from a business point of view, something that we would want to capture, something that is embedded in time and that is described in a past tense. 
So how, how does it look in identifying domain events in the, in the, uh, in the workshop? Let's take a look of a hypothetical domain of an employee asset management application. This is something that we will work on today during this workshop. And we will start from identifying, um, identifying events that are happening in this domain. So let's say a new employee was hired and we have like a, an event, as you can see, event described in the past tense. We ordered a new asset. We ordered a computer for, for this new employee. We ordered a phone. Um, for, for, for him, we assigned the asset for this employee. We handed over this asset to the employee. Maybe at some stage, the asset was damaged. Maybe it was replaced. Maybe an employee contract was terminated. And finally, our asset is returned to, uh, to our stock in, in the asset uh, let's say warehouse. So this is really like a first thing. When you map your events at the timeline, you can see that our infinite modeling space is ordered as a timeline. You can see all the different things that will be happening in our business domain and have to be translated, somehow captured by the system. And we will be then adding a couple of other elements into this into the storming so we might use different post-it cards for different things like for example hotspots to identify uh, identify some open questions potential problems notes basically to include some notes external systems to indicate some communication with third party systems policies imply some uh, more complicated automated rules, processes that are executed as a result of event. Processes, uh, policies are, uh, all, uh, are also able to chain several events together. So um, how, how will it work? Let's take a subset of our events. So, and when a new employee is hired, maybe we have a policy that automatically based on that event will trigger another event that the asset was ordered. The ordering of asset may be integrated with an external context, external system. Maybe when we hand over the asset, we might add a note that some kind of handover document must be designed. Maybe there is something that we don't know during this storming session, like how to deal with repair cost in case asset was damaged. Let's put it as a card and leave it for later. Finally, in the big picture, we need to identify actors. This is fairly simple. Actors are just user personas. And for every event, we are basically able to assign an actor. And finally, Boundaries. Boundaries are quite important from the event storming point of view because they help us to identify where the terminology is changed. Like, for example, here we can see there is an obvious boundary because the fact that the new employee was hired, it, it belongs to some kind of a different context than the whole asset management. Yeah. So new employee hired, maybe it's a context of the HR management application, but then um, ordering assets, uh, it might be a, a totally different uh, context. So this really gives you like a big picture of your solution. This is just a picture from one of our sessions when we were analyzing our, one of our applications. And you have like a, an outcome that, that shows you what the, what the system is doing. And then we go into a little bit more details, which is like a process design level, tactical domain design, which aims really to build user stories out of this 
uh, out of this uh, out of this storming session. Now, how does it work? For every domain event, we will try to identify a command that is triggering this event. Command is very simple. It's just a reverse of event. So let's take our event, asset was assigned. So the corresponding command will be assign asset. Simple as that. For every command, we might use a node to also specify what kind of parameters I need to include in order to trigger certain command. Like for example, to assign an asset, I need to provide an asset type and employee ID, his location and start date, as an example. Then, in order for the command to be issued by our actor, we typically have to display some information to this actor that will allow him to issue a command. This is called read model green cards for read models. And what kind of information do we need to display to our actor in order to assign an asset? We need to display to him like what kind of asset our is needed for, for our new employee. Maybe his employee ID, maybe his start date, maybe his location. Yeah? Based on this information, he will be able to issue this command. Sometimes at this stage, having a read model, we might also engage with, uh, with our UX designers to maybe build some wireframes on how, how the user interface could look like in order to provide this kind of interface. Finally, every command that is issued into your system is validated by the system. And this is where our business rules actually live. And this is actually the heart of domain-driven design. So the business rules. You can see the business rule is uh, uh, represented with a yellow diamond shape like this. And business rules really ensure uh, that uh, every command execution leaves the system in a consistent state. So if we take a look at our picture here, you can see that in order to assign an asset, asset must be available at a given location. Right now, one of the key questions that we will be asking ourselves here is what kind of object, what kind of business business object is responsible for actually ensuring that this rule is kept. So this is a, a, something that is called an aggregate in domain driven design and Conrad will be show, uh, will be uh, will be uh, actually talking about it in more details uh, um, uh, in a moment. But just take a look at this. In order to assign an asset I need to check whether he's available, whether it is available at a given location. It, it really indicates to me that the responsibility of keeping this business rule belongs to some kind of uh, abstract uh, construct that uh, is like an like a warehouse because it's it's responsibility of the warehouse to tell me whether there is any spare asset of a given type at, at stock currently available to be assigned. Yeah, so this is really not a business rule of the asset, it is a business rule of the, of the warehouse. Finally, having this kind of picture, you are able to translate it very easily into a user story. This is the user story. As an IT and user support user, I want to be able to assign an asset to new, newly hired employee in order to reserve it for his start date, given when then, given there is a spare asset, when I select asset type and assign to employee, the asset is successfully reserved. Yeah? 
this is how to translate the storming session into user stories. And I will be handing over to Conrad right now because it storming is an analytical tool for us that allows you to build a software model. But the biggest beauty in our opinion is that it allows you to build a model that is implementable. So every building block, every post-it that I explained previously maps to a concrete implementation and pattern in code. Um, so, Conrad, over to you. Okay, so uh, I would like to present some uh, implementation patterns that we used uh, in our application and based on a user story that uh, Maciek presented, uh, we'll try to uh, build an architecture uh, to complete this, uh, uh, this user story. Um, so I'd like to uh, present you uh, some uh, layers that uh, we had to uh, implement to, to adapt uh, the, DDD, uh, the DDD patterns. And uh, we defined uh, several layers for that. Uh, the first layer is a UI layer or API layer, which is actually responsible for uh, displaying information to the user. So uh, when you want to present some, uh, actually this layer is just used to to present the data or, or to uh, trigger some actions uh, in our in our application. So uh, to trigger the action in our application, we use uh, our application layer, which is of course also called the service layer, and uh, it defines uh, the methods and uh, and possible actions uh, that are uh, exposed uh, in our application. Uh, the service layer itself, it doesn't contain any business logic, but it plays a role of an orchestrator. It can talk to uh, other different layers uh, of our application to accomplish a given command which came from, uh, from the UI uh, layer. So to um, execute some business logic to validate some business rules, we will use uh, our domain layer, which will consist of uh, aggregates and entities uh, uh, that Magic mentioned before. And uh, to build uh, the objects of our domain layer, we'll use uh, uh, infrastructure layer. An infrastructure la layer is uh, responsible for communication with the database. And uh, it is used to retrieve the data from the database, but also uh, it is responsible for uh, data persistence. Uh, so this is the only layer that is allowed to talk directly to, to our database. So uh, going back to our uh, um, use case, uh, we would like to assign assets to, uh, to an employee, uh, as uh, Maciek uh, said before. Uh, in order to do that, at first, we have to show some data to our user, uh, to his uh, UI layer, for example, and then uh, we will perform uh, a comment. To show uh, some data to our user, we will use uh, a, query, a query. So to perform a query, um, I will quickly show you how a query affects uh, different layers of, uh, of our application. Let's say uh, our UI component uh, supported by an Apex controller uh, will make a call uh, to our application to retrieve some, uh, some data set to obtain a read model uh, for, uh, for asset management. Application, uh, the Apex controller is allowed to either call, call our application service to perform some sophisticated commands or it can call di directly uh, um, a selector in our infrastructure layer. Uh, this pattern comes from CQRS uh, approach, where you don't have to 
run the whole uh, the whole machine that is hidden in uh, in your application just to build a read model. To build a read model, you have to do it as quickly as possible, uh, so it doesn't affect your uh, performance as well. So let's say that our Apex controller calls uh, selector, which is allowed to call the database, and based on the on a query and the output on the of the query, the selector builds a data transfer object, a schema that is later exposed uh, on the UI of uh, of our client, of our user. Uh, and how uh, does it look like in code? So this is our IPX controller uh, with a simple method get employee. You pass an employee ID and uh, you expect to get um, a schema of an employee <clears throat> that would be filled with uh, all the data necessary to build a, a read model on your UI. So uh, the Apex controller calls uh, the selector and uh, it passes the employee ID. Then the selector in uh, our uh, infrastructure la layer uh, calls the database. So actually it makes an SQL query to retrieve uh, employee uh, as object and then uh, it fills uh, the employee schema uh, as an output so employee schema is a simple data transfer object uh, which then can be returned by uh, our um, selector uh, into the, the apex controller mm. But also, you can use this schema to uh, to present data in REST API as a as a response payload. Uh, so it gives us uh, a control of what we are exposing externally uh, from our application uh, to to our client. So we are not exposing any custom objects or Salesforce objects or Salesforce Salesforce custom fields, but we are exposing uh, a schema. Uh, it's like a contract uh, that uh, when a client sees our documentation, for example, they see, okay, when I call uh, this method, I will uh, obtain such a schema with, uh, with the data field. Okay, so this is how we built our read model that was fast and quick. And now we'll focus how to perform a more complex action, which is called a command. So you can see, uh, here, uh, we uh, will try to assign an asset to, uh, to the end user. So we have to perform uh, some action, and this action will affect our database. So the uh, asset will be assigned uh, to, uh, to the employee. Okay, so how we can achieve that? Let's look again into our, uh, uh, into our uh, layers, and how does a command affect uh, on the layers? So again, we have our UI component uh, supported with the Apex controller, but now Apex controller will build a command. Command is uh, some sort of a, a wrapper or a payload that needs to be filled to perform uh, an action. So an Apex controller fills a command wrapper and uses this command as an argument in our application service method. Then the application service method plays a role of an uh, orchestrator. So it calls uh, our infrastructure layer to obtain some domain objects. To obtain these domain objects, it will use uh, a repository, uh, which is responsible for building these uh, domain objects. The repository calls directly the database uh, to obtain the data. And then it can be also supported uh, by a, a factory entity. A uh, factory uh, is used to build uh, domain objects. We, when I, I mean, when you have uh, some complex logic in building your uh, your domain objects, you can use just a just a factory to to organize your code better. Uh, so such a factory, based on the uh, uh, on the output of uh, from the database call, uh, it builds uh, our aggregates and and entity. Uh, to perform some business logic and validate uh, this business logic uh, in our application. So how does it look like in the code? Uh, this is our Apex controller. 
uh, with a method assign asset, where you pass the asset time, the employee ID, and location uh, of uh, of the uh, of the asset, and uh, it prepares a command which will be used to call our application uh, layer. How does a command look like? Command is a is a payload that is used to execute uh, action in uh, in our service layer. So uh, the Apex controller is asked to fill this command. So we can use, for example, a constructor of our command, which will allow us to uh, validate uh, the the input from the UI if it's correct, and then it will be loaded into my into our uh, application layer. Such a command then is being processed in a uh, in a service method. So service method playing a role of an orchestrator. It takes uh, uh, the repository, and the repository will build a domain object, uh, which will be our warehouse. Warehouse is uh, an aggregate that is responsible for uh, validating uh, business rules and then uh, from the warehouse we can get a spare asset we will reserve asset for an employee and then we will uh, use again uh, our repository to uh, save an asset into our database you can also use uh, unit of work um, pattern uh, to gather all the records uh, to save some dml uh, calls as well and this is how the repository looks like so uh, based on uh, on the location uh, the repository makes a, um, a database call uh, to retrieve some asset objects and then uh, based on the list of the of the assets uh, assigned to a given location uh, the repository will use a factory to construct a warehouse aggregate and then uh, we have our uh, warehouse aggregate, uh, which was uh, created by the factory. And, uh, oh yeah, sorry, this is the still, uh, we are still in the infrastructure layer and we are creating the warehouse aggregate in, uh, uh, in our factory. So based on the, on the list of the assets, we are building uh, our aggregate. And this is how the aggregate looks like. Uh, it gathers the entities of, of the assets. And also, um, it is responsible as aggregate is responsible for executing and validating the business logic. So as you can see, when you ask uh, our aggregate to get a spare asset based on the asset type, uh, it will at first check if there is any assets uh, available of a given type. Uh, if not, then it will throw an exception. So a business rule is uh, is being executed, and uh, yeah, and if everything is okay, then uh, a proper asset would be returned to us. And by executing this, uh, uh, by following this uh, these patterns, uh, we have a huge control on what is going on uh, in our application. And uh, the core uh, of the of the of of uh, of, the, of the, the command is actually based in our aggregate that validates and executes the business rules. Uh, regarding the implementation patterns, uh, we'd like to share some key rules uh, with you. Um, so, what we are trying to do uh, in our application. We want to uh, separate uh, from uh, from the client, and uh, we don't want to expose uh, uh, some Salesforce internals like ID times times. That's why we use uh, entities. We use uh, also the schemas that we are exposing externally from our application. Uh, only the infrastructure layer is uh, allowed to. Uh, to call the database and is aware of the s ob uh, of the s objects so uh, only selector repository and and, and factory uh, can refer to uh, to salesforce uh, objects 
Mm, business logic is kept uh, within the domain layer. Uh, that's clear. And uh, what's really important, make explicit what is uh, implicit. So we give you a lot of tools uh, and, lot of, and different layers as well. So use the, the power of these tools and make uh, everything explicit. So everything is clear and, uh, and the maintenance of the code is also uh, much, much easier uh, when you yeah, use these tools. Just to add, Conrad, here, uh, yeah. it, it is also uh, the fact that we want to achieve the single responsibility, right? Every class is responsible for one thing. And also make explicit what is implicit means also for us that uh, really name your methods, name your behaviors of your objects as they really are in, in a business world. This will like use the same kind of terms that the business people are using to, 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 to write them directly in your code. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly. what DDD is about. And then uh, we can make use of the SFDX folders to define modules. So uh, you can build uh, the, these patterns, uh, the, the layers, everything you can organize in, uh, in SFDX folders. So it's much easier to, to maintain. Uh, leverage other good patterns like, like the unit of work, which allows you to gather uh, records to save some uh dml calls as well and uh yeah leverage dependency injection for unit testing and mocking repositories so uh for example you can use an application factory that gathers uh, different implementations of uh, of our of different layers so when well, wherever for example a service layer would need to con uh, call a repository uh, it can call the application factory to retrieve proper uh, implementation of that repository. Uh, if you use such a pattern, then it's really easy to mock different, to mock the layers uh, in unit testing, and it's very, very useful. Uh, there are also some other topics uh, that we are investigating while working on, a, uh, on our application. Uh, we have to face with, uh, with the standard Salesforce UI, and uh, mm, we have to adapt our application uh, to Salesforce tr triggers. Generally, we try to not to use them, but if you really need, we recommend to translate the trigger uh, into a command. So wh whenever someone changes a state of, of a given object, try to translate it into a command that then would be processed by uh, our uh, application. Uh, service. Mm, we also uh, try to uh, adapt similar approach to, uh, to platform events uh, to handle them and uh, yeah, and to mm, to handle some uh, some sluggers as, as well. So maybe Conrad, leave your presentation. I will just yeah. compliment. Uh, I hope this gives like a high level overview of uh, of uh, domain driven design as a concept. What are the benefits that we can see from our side? First of all, a better granular granularity and better understanding what's happening in our software. Um, so so we really uh, like have a. Uh, better control over what we expose to the external world, and we start really to talk the same language with our uh, with our uh, analysts, with our business people who are involved in the process. So this is just an example of one command that we have in part of our application. As you can see, this kind of documentation here. This is almost like a, a contract. We can expose it easily in the REST API in a, in a very understandable way. And, and we can have like a good control of this. Um, yeah, and going forward uh, for the purpose of, of this initiative, we also um, have like a very basic uh, uh, GitHub repository, which you can take a look at. Feel free to contribute and comment. 
And there are a couple of sample of uh, samples of code, uh, the code that we will uh, we'll be presenting uh, today uh, will also be there. Um, if you if you are interested by DBD, um, uh, feel free uh, to contact us, and and we'll be happy to answer uh, your questions. For us, DDD was really something like a very mind-opening, a totally different approach to software development. This is not an approach that is, is usable for every need. So we, we most likely should have, should have uh, uh, provided this explanation at the very beginning. So it's really for more complex solutions something that you really need to control high level. It's not really for like a simple crude uh, create, read, update, delete um, applications, but, but more for, for, for uh, something bigger with complex changing business rules. Um, I know this session is recorded, but there will be some Q&A. Uh, if there will be Q&A, we'll try to answer them tomorrow. And uh, for now, we would like to thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and uh, hope you have a good, uh, a good London calling uh, virtual meeting. Um, it's a pity we can meet uh, in person, but uh, I, I'm sure there will be a chance for that next year. So, guys, take care and thank you very much. Blockchain can help feed more people. And AI can help care for people. VR can help train people. Let's use technology for people to make a greater good in every community, every day. Accenture. New. Applied. Now.